the brewery. Tonight, we are pleased to uh, host author Gordon Bond, who will be talking about his book, To Cast a Freedman's Vote. Before we get started, I just wanted to encourage you all to fill out your census forms. Filling out the census is one small but very important thing everyone can do right now to help our city and our communities. If you haven't done so yet, please go to my2020census.gov and fill out the brief questionnaire. The information you provide affects funding for health care, transportation, your local schools, and many other needs. Remember, my2020census.gov. It is safe, secure, and confidential. Now, a little bit about our speaker tonight. Gordon Bond is an independent historian, author, and lecturer. He is the founder and e-publisher of GardenStateLegacy.com, a free online quarterly magazine dedicated to New Jersey history. He is the author of six books focusing on aspects of New Jersey history and has written several articles and reviews for Garden State Legacy. Bond is a native of New Jersey. He lives with his wife in Newark's historic Forest Hill neighborhood. Tonight, he will be talking about his book, To Cast a Freedman's Vote, published by Garden State Legacy earlier this year. Thomas Mundy Peterson of Perth, of Perth Amboy became the first African-American to vote under the 15th Amendment when he cast a ballot in March 1870. To Cast a Freedman's Vote explores Peterson's story by placing him in a broader historic context that makes him relevant to modern dialogues on race, suffrage, and citizenship. Gordon will answer questions after his talk. If anyone has any, a question they would like, they want to pose while he is speaking, type it in the chat box. Now, here is Gordon Bond. Thank you, Tom, and thank you everybody who has uh, signed in and joined us this evening. Uh, this is my first time doing a Zoom talk, uh, so hopefully everything will go okay. And I just want to assure you that I am wearing pants. I know that is a thing that you know you only see this much, and I also wear pants in my live presentations. <laughs> so I don't want to scare anyone. Um, but this is usually the point in the in the uh, talk where I ask for a show of hands, how many of you have heard of Thomas Mundy Peterson before this talk? Obviously, I can't see most of you, so I'm just going to assume that uh, there are some of you raising your hands. Um, if you have heard of Thomas Mundy Peterson before, chances are it is because of what happened in Perth Amboy, New Jersey on March the 31st, 1870. On that date, Thomas Peterson, Thomas Mundy Peterson became the first African American to cast a vote under the 15th Amendment to the United States Constitution. Now, um, the 15th Amendment is the third of the three, or the last of the three Reconstruction Amendments, 13th Amendment outlawed slavery. The 14th Amendment gave those who were freed uh, the, the status of citizen. And the 15th Amendment guaranteed them the uh, right to suffrage. Now, the 15th Amendment had been certified as law by the Secretary of State uh, with the colorful name of Hamilton Fish. Uh, the previous day on March 30th. And it just so happened that Perth Amboy the following day was having this charter referendum, a uh, city charter referendum election. Uh, they had decided they wanted to revise their city charter and uh, it had been approved by the state legislature. Now they needed the, uh, the citizens of Perth Amboy to approve this, uh, the adoption of this new charter. And this is the election that Peterson got to vote on. Now, Many times you will read, even now, that he was the first black person to vote in America at all. And that isn't true. Uh, many of the early state constitutions did not include any limitations on suffrage based on either race or even gender. And in the course of researching this book, I discovered that there was, in fact, a black woman who voted in Huntington County in 1802. Uh, so why should we care about Thomas Mundy Peterson and his vote? This is the first time in American history when anybody got to vote with the full guarantee and protection of the United States Constitution. Up until then, it had been left up to the states to determine who did or did not get the franchise. Um, everything that we talk about, when we talk about uh, uh, things about um, suffrage and uh, everything from voter ID laws to gerrymandering and so forth, it all is resting on a foundation that 
citizenship, that, that, that suffrage is a defining right of citizenship. It, def it is part of what it makes someone a citizen. Uh, for most, for at least the first 90 years, 90 plus years of this country's existence, that was not the case. Uh, I like to say that the relationship between suffrage and citizenship was consummated in effect when Thomas Peterson cast his vote on March 31st, 1870. And here he is casting his vote. He voted for the side that was in favor of the, uh, the new city charter and his side in fact won. Now for the next uh, nearly 15 years, Thomas Peterson rested secure in this idea that he was indeed the first, as they would say back then, colored voter under the 15th Amendment in the entire country. And the people of Perth Amboy, the white, part, the, the white people of Perth Amboy were actually very proud of that fact. There was a, I, I get into the details of it in the book, I don't have time here, but there was a very um, progressive kind of liberal uh, group of Perth Amboy citizens centered around what was the Raritan Bay Union, later the Eagleswood Academy. These were abolitionists. These were people who supported Negro suffrage, including women's rights and women's suffrage and so forth, reformers and, and artists and intellectuals and so on. And um, so this was a point of pride, civic pride for Perth Amboy, black and white, that their home was the home of this first voter. So you can imagine that they were kind of surprised when there was an article that appeared, uh, I'm gonna refer to my notes here, the Princeton Press for April the 5th, 1884. Now, at first this article seems innocuous enough. It's talking about a black musician from Princeton who was having a particularly successful uh, season uh, Mo, his name is Moses. Moses, known far and wide as the professor, is having a splendid run of business. He goes even as far as Atlantic City this season, and he's officiated at 125 sociables. But then they add, as an aside, by the way, he wears a medal conferred upon him by the people of New Jersey in honor of his being the first colored citizen to vote under the 15th Amendment in this state. Now, who they were referring to is a man named Moses Shank. Uh, Moses Shank lived from 1833 to 1890. He was a, worked predominantly as a waiter in uh, various hotels and restaurants in Princeton, but he was also uh, a popular banjo player and a fiddler, and he led what was called the Princeton Colored Orchestra. And there was a newspaper article not long afterwards uh, from Rahway, New Jersey, called the National Democrat, and they described uh, this band. This popular band is constantly receiving calls from different parts of the state. Many passengers on the trains have also enjoyed the sweet music rendered by this famed company of musicians as they go or return from their engagements. So this is Moses Shank. Uh, this is his story. Um, this obviously came as a bit of a surprise to the people in Perth Amboy. It certainly came as, as a bit of a surprise to Thomas Peterson, who for over a decade, nearly a decade and a half, had assumed that he was simply the first, again, as they would say, colored voter in the United States under the 15th Amendment. But he wanted to be sure. He wanted to know if he really did deserve this honor or not. So he asked his white friends, the movers and shakers in Perth Amboy at this time, to, uh, to investigate, to form a committee and investigate to figure out is he really the first colored voter or not? And he asked to lead this uh, committee, John Lawrence Carney. He went by J.L. Carney. Uh, you, may have, you may be familiar with the name of Commodore Carney. This is his son. And now Carney plays an important role in Peterson's story because Peterson was working in Carney's stables behind his house on the 31st. And it was Carney who came out and showed him the newspapers announcing that the 15th Amendment was now the law of the land, told him about this election that was happening in his city and encouraged him to go vote. And he was in fact one of three different people who encouraged him to vote that day, including uh, Marcus Spring, who was the founder uh, along with his wife, Rebecca Spring of the Eagleswood Academy. Um, now the committee was drawn ecumenically. It was equally between Republicans and uh, Democrats. I'm just going to go through the list quickly because these are 
very important people in Perth Amboy at this time. Among the Republicans was John L. Boggs. He was a 71-year-old accountant and former collector of the port. Uriah B. Watson, 44-year-old fire brick manufacturer, a banker. He was an ex-mayor. He had been mayor in 1881. Isaac T. Golden, 47-year-old accountant and city treasurer. And then among the Democrats was Patrick Convery, a 42-year-old coal merchant and a rising political star. He was the one who was manning the polls that day when uh, Peterson was voting. Uh, William Patterson, who we are going to come back later, he was a 67-year-old lawyer, a land developer, uh, an ex-mayor, and at that time he was a judge. And we're going we're to talk about him a little, little bit more later. And then John Fothergill, 46-year-old alderman and streets commissioner. So these guys got together and they decided they were going to write to the editor of the Princeton newspaper and, and try to get some details as to what Moses Shank's claim really was. So they wrote to the editor. The editor replied, Moses Shank was born in Princeton and quite an intelligent man. On the 4th of April, 1870, Monday, at the annual election for borough officers, Moses Shank was the first of about 100 colored voters to cast a ballot. I gave Moses the medal, and by it did not mean to claim for him more than he was the first voter in Princeton under the 15th Amendment. I have just spoken to Moses about it, and he says he did not set a very high value on Pearson's claim, for he only voted on the question of a charter amendment, while here it was for the regular election for mayor, council, etc. Now, it was traditional, April was the traditional uh, time for these general elections. It just so happened that Perth Amboy had this special election about its city charter on, the, uh, on March the 31st. But the, the, that, that objection aside, the critical point here is that he voted on April the 4th, 1870. So Pearson's priority was secure. Uh, they looked into other newspapers and looked into other records to see was there anybody else in the country who was having an election on March 31st. They found none. So as far as they were concerned, as far as they could tell, Thomas Pearson was indeed the first African-American to vote under the 15th Amendment. Uh, but of course, the article talks about uh, Moses Shank having a, received a silver medal uh, in recognition of his being that first voter in Princeton. So if he got a medal, certainly Thomas Peterson and Perth Ambush should have a medal for being the first voter in the entire country. So they took a whip around, they raised $70, which in today's money is worth about $1,850. And they decided they were going to have a gold medal minted for him. They went to Manhattan. They found a company called Alfred J. Henning and J. E. Iman. These were uh, dye uh, makers and engravers, and they had made a, a good name for themselves making these things. These are daguerreotype cases. Now, at the time uh, that daguerreotypes came out, this is a, a photographic process where you have a metal plate, there's a photographic emulsion, and you create a one-off picture, which means that you only get that one picture. The very precious commodity, and but they were subject to scrapes and and damage. So they made a business out of making these these frames that would protect the daguerreotypes. And this is an example of their work. You can see how ornate and lovely it really is. Uh, as photography evolved the, the, to other forms that uh, beyond daguerreotypes, these types of cases were no longer necessary. The market started falling out, so they started making metals. They started making metal tokens, striking these things. And in the 18th century, uh, these sorts of things were very popular. There were schools that, that would have them minted for academic uh, awards or athletic awards. There were uh, uh, fraternal organizations that would have these things made. And there were also political campaigns that would have them struck. And, and the, the, what you're seeing here, this is uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, from his 1860 presidential uh, uh, campaign. So he would hand these out as tokens at his, at his rallies. Um, these are, they, they, they did it for everyone. This is an example from Stephen Douglas. Um, they were, you know, they were not political. They, they would make them for whoever, whoever paid them to. 
So when the people from Perth Amboy arrived and were looking at what was possible, they settled on this Abraham Lincoln die as the one that they would use to strike this medal for Thomas Peterson. Now, one of the things that always puzzled me when I saw the medal is this is 1884 that they gave it to him. And by this point, Lincoln, the Lincoln iconography, he was of the president with the beard. And this is him without the beard. I always wondered why it was without the beard. And it makes sense now because it was patterned after the dye that was used for his 1860 presidential election. Uh, it seems terribly appropriate that they would choose Lincoln, this, this particular die, to honor the first uh, black voter under the 15th Amendment. Now, the other side obviously would need to be, um, would need to be customized. Now, th this, is, this is the gold medal that they, uh, the Lincoln side that they uh, struck. The other side, as I said, would have to be uh, customized. And it reads, presented by the citizens of Perth Amboy, New Jersey, to Thomas Peterson, the first colored voter in the U.S. under the provisions of the 15th Amendment at an election held in that city March 31st, 1870. Now, what's interesting is uh, they actually struck several versions of this medal or, or copies of this medal from lesser medals, M-E-T medals. Uh, and these show up in numismatic catalogs and auction catalogs and collections in silver, copper, aluminum, and something called white metal, which was a tin alloy. And there's a definite hierarchy here in terms of the value of the materials that they were making this out of. And I think what was happening is the silver ones would maybe go to the mayor or the council and so forth down the line. The tin ones, tin alloy ones, probably just went out to the general public because they were the cheapest to produce. I don't know how many were made, but they do show up in again in these numismatic catalogs and so on. But this is the gold one. There was only one struck of that. That was the presentation piece that was going to go to Thomas Peterson. And as you can see in this picture, there was also a gold bar to Thomas Peterson for a fanboy. Uh, on the back of that is the, the pin, the clasp that will allow them to pin it to his coat. Uh, so this, is the, this was the gold medal that they gave to him. They chose May 30th, 1884 as the date for the awarding ceremonies. Now, this was Decoration Day. This is a precursor to our modern Memorial Day. Uh, many cultures have traditions, especially in the spring, of decorating the graves of veterans there are flowers, uh, everything is in bloom, and you're able to clean up the graves and, and decorate them. Um, this became very important in the United States, especially after the, the, the Civil War, both North and South. So there were a lot of different ceremonies uh, honoring veterans that were going on that day, including this presentation ceremony for Thomas Peterson. Now, they gave it to him uh, in this building, the, the, the site for the, the venue, uh, the venue was the City Hall in Perth Amboy. It's, it's appropriate on multiple levels. Uh, first of all, this is where he voted. So the ballot was set up in the council chambers inside of this building. Um, people, as they walked across the city square that is in front of this building, uh, may have remembered that, or at least known that in colonial days, there were slave auctions being held there. Um, now, Perth Amboy had entertained uh, the notion that they could best New York as being the main port of entry into the Northeast. Obviously, that did not happen, but at the time, there were ships coming from Africa with captured enslaved people that they would keep in barracks down by the waterfront, and then they would march them to this town square to sell them into slavery. So the idea that this area that has that history, now they're there to honor the first African-American voter, I think is very poignant. I should also point out that uh, in the audience that day was a woman named Lucy Peterson, 84 years old. This is Thomas Peterson's mother. Thomas Pierce's mother had been a slave as a younger woman. And here she was, she had lived long enough where she was witnessing white men pinning a medal, a gold medal to her son's coat for being the first black voter in the country. I think that's pretty cool. Now, I said we were gonna come back to William Patterson. Uh, William Patterson was the man who gave the, uh, the keynote address. And this was reproduced 
in a pamphlet afterwards. And to the 21st century ear, his talk or his, his, his presentation was very verbose and rather torturous, to be perfectly blunt. Uh, at the time, with the Romanticist uh, movements and so on that were going on in, in literature, this was probably considered, you know, this probably went over very well. Um, but, I mean, to give you an idea, he wants to talk about how Peterson, there can only be one first voter and in, in, in all of recorded history. And in order to set that stage, he goes back and is talking about how they talk about the glacial movements that carved out the Raritan Valley and all of this sort of thing. He's talking, he uses uh, Latin phrases and sayings and, and this terrible poetry and so forth. And, you know, so again, this is to, at the time, it was probably, it probably went over very well. To us, it seems a little odd. Um, now, Patterson features into Peterson, uh, I'm sorry, Patterson features into Peterson's story in a very important way. And uh, cutting a long story short, Thomas Peterson married a woman named Daphne Reeves. Daphne Reeves was born to a mother named Betty. Betty was a slave of a man of her family known as Andrew Bell. They go into all the detail, obviously, in the book. Um, when Andrew Bell died, he left Daphne and her sister, Jane, each $500 legacy. And that was a lot of money back then. It was especially, uh, especially unusual for a white man to be leaving that amount of money to the daughters of his former slave. Um, now this was kept in trust for Daphne. They would draw off the interest and so her and Thomas could live off of that. Now, the trust was controlled by William Patterson, so he was the one who controlled the money, and he would make sure that she got the, the, the proceeds of the interest. Um, in 1866, the, the Petersons decided that they wanted a house of their own. And so in return for that $500 principal, William Patterson, again, he was a land developer, he owned property, he had a house built for the Petersons, on Commerce Lane. Commerce Lane no longer exists. It's off of Commerce Street, which does still exist. Now, the house is no longer there. It disappears around 1913, 1912, of that period. Um, but there was not a lot of development on it since, and the only people to live in that house were the Petersons. So this property, it's an empty lot now. It is slated for development as a parking lot, and I am desperately trying to get for a fanboy to, uh, to, to allow there to be a, as a developer, to allow there to be a, an archeological investigation of the site. Because anything personally you find there is probably going to date back to the Petersons. So obviously William Patterson knew the family. He knew Thomas uh, Peterson. He knew his wife. Uh, he was friendly with him. He was uh, there to celebrate a black man as a voter. Um, and yet the language that he used, besides the verboseness that makes it awkward to the modern ear, there are certain phrases that he uses that I think are very telling. Now, he needs to explain to people why it is that it's been 14 years between the time that Thomas Pearson cast his vote and they finally got around to honoring him and giving him this medal. Now he could just say that there is a there was a uh, a colored man in, in Princeton because Moses Shank was the catalyst for all of this. Instead, he employs some very awkward phrases that hit the modern ear particularly hard. He, refers to, there is a common saying familiar to all that a darkie is under the wood pile. Now, this is a colloquialism of the time. You encounter this in other contexts, uh, including with a word more offensive than darkie. It is a, a reference to a, a stereotypical um, sneaky Negro, dishonest Negro. So by this phrase, he's casting dispersions on Moses Shank that he is being dishonest, he is being sneaky, as if he is trying to steal something from Thomas Peterson, and by extension, from the people of Perth Amboy. It gets a little worse. He wants to, to mention that uh, Shank was from Princeton, and this is how he expresses it. So it, came not, so it came out not long ago that another of the colored clan to make a rhyme say black and tan, living in a university town of high repute where the same dark hue was interwoven in the academic flag. 
there's a lot to unpack here, obviously. Uh, I don't know why he felt the need to insert this bizarre little rhyme. He probably thought he was being clever. This was a, a clever rhetoric. Uh, he refers, he doesn't refer to, to Princeton specifically. He calls it university town. What is in Princeton? Princeton University. What are the what are what are the colors of, of Princeton University? Orange and black. And he thought, I guess, that this was clever to to point this out. Now, again, this is somebody who is sympathetic to Peterson, who is a fan of Peterson. He's there to celebrate the idea that this black man was the first colored voter, the pride that Perth Amboy has in this. And yet he still uses this language that is very much cast him as well as Moses Schenck for that matter, as what we would call today the other. There is that degree of separation in his language. And he's not the only one who does this. There's other people, uh, again, friends of Thomas Peterson, they're celebrating people who liked him, who are there to sing his praises, who are still using this language. And I think it's very evocative of what the uh, the attitudes were, even among people who are not ardently racist. Uh, this comes across even in this context. Now, he did have one uh, verse here, which is particularly, probably his most eloquent out of the whole speech. And so we need to decorate by a token on the freedman's coat, the man who was in any state, the first to cast a freedman's vote. So this talk is called A Token on the Freedman, uh, Freedman's Code because we're talking about the medal. My book is called To Cast a Freedman's Vote. I guess I can't be that hard on the guy since I got really cool, two really cool titles from him, but there we are. Now, after all this was over, uh, Thomas Peterson went to the studios of William R. Tobias. William R. Uh, Tobias was a photographer. He had a, a studio on High Street there in Perth Amboy, and there he had his photograph taken. If you've ever seen a picture of Thomas Peterson, this is the this is what it is from. <clears throat> it's a picture of him wearing his medal. Now, this is a particularly fine example. This is from the collections of the Smithsonian Institution National Museum of African American History and Culture. You can see him there wearing his medal. This is a particularly uh, high quality uh, print. This one uh, it, this one comes from the Perth Amboy Public Library. Uh, it's a obviously rougher condition. Now, uh, if some of you may be familiar with Gary Suretsky, he is a photography history guy, especially specializing in New Jersey photographers and um, Newark daguerreotypists, for example. And he examined this this copy, and what he sees in terms of the fading that is there, uh, he thinks that is. Uh, it's indicative of sun damage, that this was on display somewhere and it was faded because of sunlight. The ragged edges and the backing, that was probably from it being cut down to be put into a frame. So evidently this was, um, evidently this was maybe on, uh, this was on uh, display somewhere. Now, I don't know, the, the, the provenance of these photographs, both the Smithsonian one and this one are, are unknown. However, um, there, on the back of this one is written property of, looks like Mrs. R. L. Young. I found a Ralph L. Young in Perth Amboy, but he postdates Peterson's life. So how he got this, what the story is, we really just do not know. It presents a bit of a mystery. Um, now, you know, I, I said before that uh, we were talking about the garotypes, that these were one-offs. This photograph was made on a glass plate as a negative, which meant you could make multiple copies of this thing. And there are three that I know of. I found reference to a fourth. There's probably more of them out there that I, people probably don't even know what they have. If anybody knows where there is another copy of this, I'd be, be interested in knowing. Um, it, it, I found reference that Peterson himself used to sell copies of this to, uh, to make a little extra money off his fame at, at picnics and fairs and so forth. So there's probably a lot of them uh, more out there. Uh, now, this is a... Okay, my, sorry, my, there we go. Uh, my PowerPoint froze for a moment there. Uh, now, this is what the Perth Amboy one probably looked like when it was new. And you can see it has all the, the board around it and the, the Tobias imprint at the bottom. You see how, how 
sharp uh, th this image is. And this one is going to be of interest to Newark people because this is from the collections of the Newark Historical Society here, I'm sorry, the New Jersey Historical Society here in Newark. Um, this is in their, their library. And this is a particularly fine example. You can see how, how rich and deep the, the, the uh, photo is. But what makes this one especially cool is what's on the other side. Now, all of these, all three of them have the same label. It's an inscription of what was written on his medal. But there's a handwritten inscription on this one. It says, Thomas Peterson to J. Lawrence Boggs, October 17th, 1897. And then there's a list, it says committee, and there's a list of the people who were on the committee who investigated his priority against the Moses Shank claim. And he also includes uh, James M. Chapman, who was the mayor at the time. Now, if you notice, there is a J. Lawrence Boggs Sr. listed as being on this committee. J. Lawrence Boggs Sr. by 1897 was deceased, but he had a son by the same name, June, a, a J. Lawrence Boggs Jr. That, that appears to be who this picture was uh, inscribed to. And I believe that this may be the only known example, at least that I'm aware of, of Thomas Peterson's own handwriting. Right here, you can see his handwriting, his name, and this is in the collections here in Newark. So this, I think, is a really cool piece. It's a very special uh, example. Now, I want to, I've told you what happened about the medal, how it came about, who made it, and how Peterson got it. I want to take a step back here for a moment and take this event and put it into a broader context. So Thomas Peterson is presented to us even today as his story is presented to us as being a step in evolution towards a more perfect union. Uh, it is often presented even, you know, there are events in Perth Amboy celebrating Thomas Peterson where they're celebrating the idea that there were these, uh, the, 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 this community in Perth Amboy that was so progressive and so forward thinking and so egalitarian that they would uh, they would encourage a black man to vote in 1870 and then celebrate him in 1884. And the, the city still takes great pride in that piece of history. And they should. This is a, a, something we should be taking pride in. This is important history. It is significant. But in focusing just on the medal alone, or I'm sorry, just on the vote alone and the medal, because these are the two things most people know about Peterson, uh, invariably Peterson becomes a prop in their story. It becomes more about the white community in Perth Amboy than about Peterson himself and what he represents in the larger history of civil rights, of voting rights. And what I tried to do in my book is to put his story in a larger context and to kind of recenter him in, in his own narrative. Um, it's not as uplifting and happy and wonderful of a story as you might like, or as people might like to think. Uh, and an example of how this works is the story of the end of the Reconstruction era. I just want to talk about that briefly. So, sorry, my, it's frozen again. There we go. So, in 1876, there was a presidential election and this gentleman, the Democrat Samuel J. Tilden, he was the winner. He won the popular vote. Now, it's worth noting that the 1876 presiden presidential election had 81.8% of eligible voters turning out. This remains the largest voter turnout in all of American history, 1876, this election. Now, we'll see what happens in 2020, but for right now, this, this holds the record. Now, if you're scratching your head thinking, I, I don't remember Samuel J, President Samuel, Samuel J. Tilden, I must have missed that in history class, he did not win. He lost the Electoral College. This was going to sound familiar. He lost the Electoral College to Rutherford B. Hayes. Now, Rutherford B. Hayes won the Electoral College 185 to 100, 184 by one vote. This is, in addition to having the largest voter turnout, it is the a uh, close electoral college victory in all of American history. What this meant, though, was that 
when it came time for the Congress to certify the results, there was a real concern that the Democrats might contest the election. After all, their guy had won the popular vote. The Electoral College was that close. They would have had possibly, arguably had grounds to do so, but they didn't. They struck what was called the Compromise of 1877. Now, what the Compromise of 1877 was basically about is we won't contest this election provided you, go, you give us certain things. The primary thing was the end of Reconstruction. And what that meant was the removal of the remaining federal troops out of the former Confederacy. There were other uh, aspects about making sure there was a Democrat on his cabinet and some, some aid packages, financial aid packages and so forth. But the, the part that really that is germane to Peterson's story is there was a sort of gentleman's agreement that the South, the former Confederacy, would then be able to deal with, quote, their Negroes as they saw fit without the interference of the federal government, without the interference of Northerners. This caused abolitionists and people who were uh, supportive of Negro suffrage and everything else to call this the, cor the 1877 corrupt bargain. What this did was it opened up the floodgates to virulent uh, Jim Crow laws. Uh, now, this is seven years. This is just seven years after Peterson had cast his vote. Uh, by, you know, Peterson died in 1904. By 1900, the black vote in the United States, especially in the South, was as good as nullified. So the gains that Peterson's vote represented were gone by the time he died. Now, I want to talk about the, the, the so-called, what I'm calling the Peterson period in voting and civil rights. Now, um, you might wonder why we should really care about Pearson and as much as um, the opportunity to become that first voter, it was just dumb luck uh, that Perth Amboy just happened to be having that election the day after the, the 15th Amendment was made, the, certified as the law of the land. Uh, he was, it was a, a, you know, a, a profile in courage to go and vote when you were being encouraged by the white community. There was no real inherent risk in that. And yet, I mean, Peterson could have just voted and, at the behest of some white guys and gone back into the, to, to work and just disappeared into history. He didn't do that. What he did was he embraced civic life. He uh, voted in every election he could until the day he died. He, part, he was a representative in Middlesex County in political conventions. When a political party uh, disappointed him, he switched parties. He knew his own mind. Um, he ran for, and unfortunately was unsuccessful, but he ran for elected office in Perth Amboy as a councilman. Um, in that very pedestrian act of just paying attention and voting and participating, I think Thomas Peterson's experiences are reflective of what a lot of, or a majority of Black Americans we're experiencing at this point in history. Um, the defining feature of the black experience in America up until this point had been slavery. It had been, it was finally removed under the 13th Amendment at great cost of blood and treasure to the nation. So it must have felt like the country was at last making this investment in freeing them and in, in, in their future. Uh, there were things like the Freedmen's Bureau. There, there was trying to help them to go from being property to becoming citizens. There were black universities that were starting. Um, the seeds were being planted that would come to fruition in the early 1900s with things like the Harlem Renaissance. So it must have seemed to Peterson's generation like at long last, we're going to get our shot at a seat at the table of American democracy. Well, it didn't turn out quite that way. Um, the Peterson period of voting in civil rights history obviously begins with 1870, with the 15th Amendment, goes through the 1877 Compromise. I would bookend it at the opposite end with 1896, the Supreme Court decision, Plessy v. Ferguson. If you know nothing else about that, that court case, you probably have heard of the phrase separate but equal. This was a, pr a legal principle that uh, undergirded the uh, segregation 
that would last in the United States until 1954, Brown v. Board of Education. Now, Thomas Peterson's experience, um, again, this is representative of what a lot of other black people were going through. They saw that there was, uh, that they were getting political power. There were uh, other black men who were running for and winning elections on local, state, and federal levels. There were black congressmen at this point. Uh, Thomas Peterson's brother, Louis Peterson, who we'll talk about in the book, he was elected as a justice of the peace in Plainfield, New Jersey. So it must, again, it must have seemed like at long last, there was an evolution. There were, there were going, things were going to get better. And then you see this history and you realize that his story is not quite so clean and uplifting and happy as we might like to think of it as being. And if you just focus on the vote alone, if you just focus on the medal alone, you don't necessarily see that larger context. And it also makes it, it also speaks to things that are going on now. It makes his story relevant to us today as much as in his own time. Uh, but what it also does, if you look at this event, the medal in 1884, that kind of sits in the middle between the Compromise of 1877 and 1896 plus E.V. Ferguson. And when you look at the voting medal, ceremony, when you look at what was going on at that time, in that larger context, it takes on a very different and more positive uh, and hopeful tone. What I always say is that they were pinning a medal to the man's coat for doing something that in another part of the country at that same time, they probably would have been putting a noose around his neck for having dared. That's what makes this important. That's what makes Peterson's story important. When you take that, those steps back and put them in that context, that is what makes him so fascinating. That's what makes him uh, important in civil rights and voting rights history. That's what I found fascinating about him. So fascinating, in fact, that I wrote a book about him. Uh, to cast a Freedman's vote, it is available. I have to do my, my, my pitch at the end here. It is available on my website, gardenstatelegacy.com. If you, on the, the, the main page, the homepage, if you scroll down just a little bit, you will see ordering information is $20. Uh, let me know if you want me to autograph it for you. Uh, I won't even charge you extra for my autograph. If you want me to make it out to somebody, let me know. I'd be happy to do so. And uh, with that, thank you very much for letting me prattle at you for, uh, about Thomas Peterson. And uh, thank you for having me. And I will be happy to take any questions. Well, Gordon, thank you very much. That was, that was a terrific talk. Um, so, so he died, so Peterson died in 1904, right? He said, so, um, did he continue voting? Was he allowed to continue voting? You said he ran for city uh, town council at one point, right? Yes. So, he yeah. voted in every election he could until the day he died. Uh, oh. there was still that, at least in Perth Amboy, uh, anyway, I mean, it, it, the, the, the oppression of the black vote was predominantly in the former Confederacy under the, the Jim Crow laws and so on. Uh, there was still, I mean, the, New Jersey in the North was not immune to some of those attitudes. And yeah. I, again, I do talk about it in the book. Um, but it, I mean, it was maybe, it was a different type of, it was a more um, implied racism than, than institutional yeah. as it had been in the South. But in Prathamboy, at least, he was still, yes, he was still certainly allowed to vote. And he, again, he voted until, until he died. And he did run for a, a, a city council seat. He did not win. He got two, it's a, I'm, I'm, I'll, I, not to give it all away, but there is one story that I think is really awesome that I, I, I have to tell. These are one of those amazing things you discover when you do this kind of work. When, when Thomas Peterson voted in 1870, there was a white man who, witnessed him voting, who tore up his own ballot and said, if those people could vote, my, then I might as well quit. It's not worth anything. Uh, in 1879, when Thomas Peterson was running for council, the council seat, he received two votes. One was his own. The other, I learned, was, I don't know the man's name, but it was the same man who had torn up his ballot in 1870. So sometime between 1870 and 1879, Thomas Peterson won him over yeah. to from going from Apparently. bringing up his vote to voting for the black guy, which I think is pretty awesome. Yeah, okay. Um, my colleague, uh, Dale Colston, um, wrote a note. Thank you for mentioning that Perth Amboy as a slave point, 
slave port. Many were not aware that that was the case. Yeah. I don't really think of slave ports being in the north, but they, they were until- They were, yes. And Perth Amboy was, what, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, people owned slaves in Perth Amboy. Uh, there is yeah. a story that uh, William Whitehead relates in his seminal history of Perth Amboy about uh, an attempted murder of a white woman that the guy tried to, to frame a child for doing, it was a black man, he tried to, fl to frame a child, uh, a black child who had just been recently imported, who didn't really know, didn't speak the language and know what was going on. They ended up burning them both at the stake. Uh, and, and yeah, and making sure, you know, make sure everybody got to see this as a warning. So, uh, you know, there were, there, there were uh, petitions to Governor uh, William Franklin uh, not to permit any kind of abolition because this is the only way to keep the blacks from rising up and putting the white population in slavery. So yes, Perth Amboy specifically and certainly New Jersey in general yeah. does have that history and yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah New Jersey has a really uh, interesting complicated history. Yes. Uh, with race and slavery and yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions or comments. So uh, somebody did um, provide a link to your website, GardenStateLegacy.com, for people who want to buy the book. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to do a little plug for it too. You did a plug, so we, uh, that's very good. Okay, so um, I just wanted to, so that concludes our program for tonight. Thank you, Gordon, for sharing Thomas. Thank you for having me. Story. You're welcome. Th thank you for sharing Thomas Mundy Peterson's story with us. Uh, if anyone would like to purchase a copy of Gordon's book, just visit GardenStateLegacy.com and scroll to the bottom of the page. Thank you to everyone who attended this virtual book talk from the Newark Public Library. For other events coming up, visit the library's website, npl.org, and click on the word calendar near the top of the page. Stay safe, everyone. Good night. Okay, so I will... I don't want to end the meeting. I want to say goodbye to you, Gordon. So but, All right. Thanks, Tom. I really appreciate it. This is a lot of yeah, fun. Okay. Great. Hopefully okay, it, was, so it was okay. <laughs> I hope oh yeah, no, it was but it was terrific. You were great for, for your first Zoom thing. That was